Okay, Genesis chapter 3. I want to show you something here. This is something I used at the men's conference just a while, a couple weeks back. We know this is the fall of man. I'm going to ask you to drop down. Um, we'll, just, we'll start in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. The scripture reads, The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say? Did God really say you must not eat from the tree, from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, may, we, may eat from, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you should. You must not touch it or you will die. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, help me, Lord, to proclaim your message to your people. Nothing more, nothing less, Father. May you have all the glory, all the honor and praise this morning. For we love you and praise you and commit this time in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I used this passage in a, in a wedding, believe it or not, just recently. And it's not something I've ever done before. I felt led to do so. So, James, if you have chapter 3 up there, keep it, keep it up there, please, because I'm going to be moving a little bit. So stay with me. Again, I apologize for all the jumping around. Uh, but James will have it on the overhead, and he's pretty good at that. So you stay with me. If you don't feel like flipping and turning, just watch the overhead. The serpent was more crafty. Does anybody have a synonym for the word crafty? Skilled and deceived. Cunning. 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 Lake County's word slick. Smooth. What is it? Shrewd? Shrewdest. Subtle. That's a sneaky mug. Deceitful. He is sneaky. That's why we call sneaky people snakes, right? Right. So this serpent, this serpent, this serpent was crafty, more crafty than any other wild animals in the, the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from the tree of the garden? First of all, uh, he's already doubting. This is what Satan does. He throws doubts into your mind. He causes doubt. Maybe you're a father here today and you think, you know what, I've blown it. I have no authority. I have no right to lead my family. I screwed it up so bad. I've lost my uh, my, I lost my credibility in the eyes of my children or whatever. That's Satan whispering into your ear. Right. He can't erase God's assignment in your life. God has called you to be a father. You have a responsibility to raise your children. Don't let him talk smack in your ear. Right. Amen? Amen? This is what he does. This is all he can do. Right. All he can do is run his mouth and send his demons to do their dirty work. That's all he can do. He cannot change who you are. He cannot change your God-given role. What God has called you to, what God has created you for. He cannot change that. That's right. All he can do is cause you to doubt it. Amen. Pastor Joey, uh, two weeks ago, he said uh, that all he can do, he can't keep you down. He just, he just lies to you and tells you you can't get up. Right. He can't keep you down. Right. And he's telling Eve, he's lying to her already. Did God really say casting doubt? She's, you must not eat from any tree in the garden. God never said that. You must not eat from any tree. God never said that. God said you can eat any tree. Said this one. <laughs> right? That's what he said. Next verse. Next verse. Then the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. Verse, go on. Next verse. But God said, he did say you must not eat from fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Hmm. Now, here's the million dollar question of the day. Where's Adam at? Why is this dude talking to my lady? Right? <laughs> Adam is asleep at the wheel, guys. Which is what a lot of guys do today. We have conversations yesterday in a meeting, in a leadership meeting, regarding coasting. We go through seasons of life. Adam was coasting here. He's probably underneath the shade tree because it was hot. Told Eve, go get me something to eat. And she's looking for fruit. She runs into this clown. <laughs> and he starts chirping in her ear, and she's buying into his lies, and she's being deceived. And Adam is not being the man that God has called him to be in leading. He's supposed to provide. Very good, Frank. He says, so you must not touch it or you will surely die, Eve said. God never said that. God said you can't touch it. I don't know what Bible she's reading. He never said that. Verse 4. You will surely die. You won't, surely will not die, the serpent said. Next verse. For God knows when you eat of the tree, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Verse five. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, temptation. What Satan lays before you is always good, at least you think it is, and pleasing to the eye. 
and desirable for gaining wisdom, power, greed. She took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. He's standing right next to her. Adam's not leading. He's not doing what God called him to do. What's the problem? That's a problem, church family. And this is the problem in our culture today because we've minimized the role and the authority and the responsibility of the man in the home. Come on now. Preach it. The media's done it. Everybody's doing it. Our culture has put the man in the back seat. And a lot of us, to be honest with you, are fine with that, especially if you got a good woman. If you got a good woman who's leading, you're like, cool, this is less work for me. I mean, if you got a good woman, I ain't going to lie, I got a good woman. And when she's leading, half the time you guys see me in the car, she's driving. I'm in the passenger seat. <laughs> I mean, and I let my wife drive. There's other reasons for that. But, uh, but the reality is I have a good woman. And so if you have a good woman, you don't mind her leading. And you, you know, we'll lead from behind. Well, God didn't call us to be chauffeured around, for lack of a better term. And I'm not talking about in the car. I'm talking about through life. He's called us to be men to lead. And so this goes, you might say, okay, Pastor, it's Father's Day. You're talking about a husband. Well, it starts with a wife. At least it's supposed to. Okay, and so God has called us as men to be men, to lead our family, starting with our wives. And a lot of times we feel like we disqualified that because we screwed it up in some form or fashion. Let me tell you this. I shared this with some of you before. When God called me into ministry, I was not so sure that he wanted me to be a pastor. I said, there ain't no way, God, that you're calling me, a knothead like me, to be a pastor. There's no way. And everybody knew it, except me. I was the last one to accept. I knew I just didn't want to accept it. And the last person I shared it with was my wife. You know why? Because nobody knows me like she does. We went for a walk, Mundell Field and Hobart. We're walking around the track. We're talking. That's what we do. And I say, hey, I got something to say to you. And she looks at me like, oh, here we go. I said, please don't interrupt me until I'm done. She said, I lose my train of thought. She says, Okay. And we're talking. She's quiet. When I'm done talking, I look at her. She, <laughs> she looks at me with what I call the melting face. She doesn't know what it is. <laughs> she says, I'm not happy, Jose. I don't want to be a pastor's wife. I said, well, that makes, I don't want to be a pastor. It does. We're good. But that's a problem, though, because if God is calling right. us, we don't have a choice. So she said, I said, I don't know what this looks like. I don't know how this unfolds. I don't know. I don't know. We'll just wait and see. And then Tina looks at me. We're walking. She, she don't want to be. The, she don't want to live in this aquarium that leaders live in. And I understand that. I get it. As a police officer for many years, I live in the same fish tank at work. So she tells me, "This blew me away." She looks at me. She says, "Can't say that I'm surprised, though." She knew God was calling. She knew it. That scared me all the more. The woman saw the fruit was pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom. She took it, she ate it, and turned around and gave some to her husband who was standing right there, letting her interact with, the, the, with Satan. Man, she, he, thank you. He's letting her interact with a snake. Guys, I hope you're not that guy. We can be that guy sometimes. You see some snake talking to your wife, I hope you step up. So we see Adam drops the ball here. Okay. The, the institution of marriage is the first institution that God ordained. Okay. So here's what I want you to know. What's Adam's problem here? I'll tell you what his problem is. He's flawed. He's broken. He's a human being. None of us are perfect. I love the infallible word of God. You know why? Because it records the good, the bad, and the ugly of people's lives. Right. And so I read the stuff in the Bible, and I say, man, this stuff is real. These people were real. Their challenges were real. Their struggles were real. And I think, man, and that gives me hope. Right. So what do we have here? We have, uh, here's my first point for you. If, you. if you normally like to take notes, people ask me all the time, Pastor, why don't you make an outline so that we can take notes? Well, you know what? Because you don't take notes. If you took notes, if everybody was writing in paper, I would make you an outline. Most people ain't doing that. And then when the church is over, I'll find your outlines on the floor or in the pews or in the seats. I'm just being honest. It's a waste of paper. We're killing trees. But if you want an outline, start outlining. And maybe if everybody's outlined, I'll make you one. But chances are we're not. So here's what I want you to see. I use the, the word father as an acrostic or an acronym. So the letter F, your first point is this. Your father, your father is fallible. He is prone to make mistakes. He's prone to make mistakes. 
He's going to screw it up sooner or later. At that men's conference, after I was done teaching, we went down to eat. <laughs> we had dude food. It was good. So we're sitting there, we're eating. And uh, it was like hot dogs. It was man, man stuff, man stuff, chili dogs, man food. So I'm eating, and uh, the guy sitting next to me, I won't tell you he, who he was, he said something about it's kind of like when you first find out that your father's not perfect. I don't remember the, the topic of the conversation, but I looked over him. I said, yeah, you know, your dad, you esteem him, and you should. The Bible says honor your father. Amen? And your father, if you had a good dad, you esteem your dad. You're like, man, my dad's the man. My dad's the man. He's Superman. He's this. He's that. You know, my dad will beat your dad up. You know, we, we play that my dad's better than your dad game all the time. We esteem our father. At least you should. But then there comes a point sooner or later where your dad steps in it. Yep. He makes a mistake. A blunder. And you look at your old man like, mm -hmm. some dad you are. You don't have that right. You don't. You have a responsibility to honor your father. Your father's fallible. He's flawed. He's imperfect. He's frail. Come on now. Just like you. I promise you, if you have a good father, he doesn't do that to you. I know he doesn't. Samson. Extraordinary man of God, flawed. I don't have time to get into all the verses. David, King David. Let me tell you this. A, a, a wise man once told me this. It was awesome. He said, I am not stronger than Samson. Samson was a bad dude. Samson was a bad dude. Read up on him. That was a bad dude. You weren't going to run up on Samson. I don't care how many guys you had with you. Samson was a bad, like, like I stated, Mama Jam. He was a bad dude. Okay, he was strong, he was a beast, kind of a chick magnet too, it's kind of his downfall. What about King David? King David was faithful, this guy loved God, the Bible says he loved God, faithful, man of God, slain by the same weakness. What about Abraham, man of faith? Man, the Bible says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Right. Abraham was a man of God. Faith. But he's imperfect. He's weak. There's a passage in Genesis where he lies and tells the king that his wife is his sister because he's afraid the guy's going to kill him. He lies. Yet this is the same Abraham we see a little while later ready to sacrifice his son because God told him to. So we see a man, a fallible, flawed, broken human being whose life Goes like this. He goes through seasons. He goes through cycles. I share this with you for a reason. If you have a father who was pretty crummy, cut him some slack, especially if he wasn't saved. Come on now. If he was lost in his sin, the Bible says it is sin that works in us. It is sin that gets us to produce the things that we do. Even the Christian is prone yeah. to the sinful natures of the heart. Fortunately for us, we have a spirit in us that convicts us and pulls us back onto God. If you don't have that, you could be in big trouble. So here's my, my encouragement for you. Your father's flawed. He's frail. He's imperfect. And I'm talking to you, fathers. You're broken. If you screwed it up, you have not disqualified your God-given <laughs> role to be a father. What do we know about fathers? Fathers should be fair with their children. One of the things that I heard um, somebody once say, hey, you got to treat them the same. I'm like, no, you don't. You can't treat them the same. If you got more than one child, chances are their personalities are in stark contrast. And you cannot treat them the same because to treat them the same would not be fair. One may be older than the other. One may be male or female. One has personalities. They're different. You don't treat them the same. Treating them the same is not fair. What do we know about our God? Our God is fair. Whatever God chooses to do in your life and in my life, we know that he'll be fair. He has no choice. He has to be because God is good. Amen. See, I'm going through my outline, and because I have it on my email, I, uh, I'm getting text messages. People wishing me happy fathers, and I'm, I'm swiping them out. This is a distraction. Fortunately for me, God has wired me with a one-track mind. I can only think about one thing at a time. So you, if that's a problem, I'm encouraging you to shut your phone off. Um, and I believe that's, that's Satan's timing, that he doesn't know that doesn't work too well for me. I can only focus on one thing at a time. It's a blessing and a curse. Men of faith, 
your father should be a man of faith. And I'm going to get to why in a little bit. Amen. And we should fear God. Amen. Being a man of faith means you fear God. And as Pastor Frank mentioned earlier, it's not a reverential fear where you're terrified that God's going to strike you dead. It's a reverential fear. Man, I love my father. You know, if I think about my earthly father, my earthly father is the man. There is nothing he wouldn't do for me. Nothing. I got a wonderful dad. I love my father. And you know what? I've realized this late in life. It took me a long time to figure it out. But I strive to please my dad. Nothing makes me feel better than my father putting his arm around me and saying, I'm proud of you, son. Right. Nothing. You don't know what that does for me. I didn't realize the effect it had on me. But that's what we should desire. He's a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are, and I'm loved by you. That's who I am. Man, I don't deserve God's love, but I've got it. Unconditional love from a father who's good all the time. Why wouldn't you strive to please him? Abraham loved God more than anything else and was willing to do what God said, even sacrifice his only son. The F in your acrostic father stands for fallible, flawed, frail. Those are the weaknesses. We should be striving to be fair, full of faith, but faithful, and to fear God. Here's your A. Available. This is a problem in the world we live in today. Our God is faithful to us. Amen? Amen. Is our God faithful? Yes, sir. Once a week? No, all the time. All the time our God is faithful. Whenever God is not near to you, it's because you strayed off, not him. So if our God is available to, all the t to us all of the time, then we as parents, fathers, should try and strive to be available to our children all of the time. Again, if you had a father who wasn't, it's because he's flawed. Some of us, we use the excuse for work. I got to work. Well, I'm tired. I got to work midnight, so I need a nap. And, and some of those things are valid, but let me tell you something. When you're looking for an excuse, any little thing will do. Fathers don't connect with their children. I did, a, I, did a, uh, I did the research some years ago to find out how much time the average father spends with his kid in a week, and it was ridiculous. I don't remember what it was. But in seven days, cumulatively, you should at least be able to put about 10, 12 hours together, right, you would think? In a, in a week, seven days, let's give, them two, give your kid two hours a day for seven days, and you should have 14 hours at the end of the week, cumulative, wouldn't you say? Sure. I mean, you think. But if you can't work because you work all week, so you can't spend it so well, well, you can jam it in on the weekend then. Spend some quality time with your kid, right? I forgot what the statistic was, but it was alarming. The average father was not spending nearly that amount of time with his children. There's no connection. Fathers are not available to their kids. We bark out orders to our kids. Oh, the room better be clean when I get back. And, and that's the extent of our relationship and interacting with our children. That should not be the case. We should make ourselves available to our children. James, Proverbs, verse, chapter 1, verse 8, if you would please. Your father should also be, if you have a father, if he wasn't, then you should striving to be an advisor to your child. This is your letter A in fathers, the acrostic. He says, listen, to my, listen, my son, to your father's instructions and do not forsake your mother's teachings. This is Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, writing a proverb for us to live by. Listen, my son, to your father's instructions. You know, we have kids that'll look at the dad and say, hey, don't tell me not to smoke. Your dad's telling you, hey, son, don't smoke. It's bad for your health. As he's blowing secondhand smoke in your face. So your kid looks at the father and says, he's got no right to tell me jack as he's blowing smoke in my face. Yes, he does have the right. He's your dad. Well, he's a poor example. That he is. But he is still your dad. And if you're a Christian, you have no right to disregard the word of God because it's convenient for you. None. So when the Bible says, listen, my son, to your father's instructions, it'd be a good idea to listen to your dad when he speaks. Now, he might be a horrible messenger, but the message is still the same. He's your dad. He has a role. Love your father. Honor him. Respect him. Well, you have a chance because one day you won't have that chance. One of my first Mother's Day sermons I preached in this church, the kid came to the front and bawled his eyes out at the altar and told me my mother died. And we were not on good terms. And now I cannot reconcile it. I cannot fix it. It's too late. 
I've ministered to him and prayed with him, explained to him you know, his forgiveness and grace and how to let that go. And I, I went through that process with him. But listen, I want to encourage you, don't be that guy. The Bible says, let the sun not go down on your wrath. Fix it. If you have a, there's a wedge between you and your parents. Fix it where you have a chance because tomorrow may be too late. <coughs> we should be admonishers. Advisor to our parent or to our children, we should be an admonisher to our children. Proverbs verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 3, James. And I apologize for my phone. This is a distraction for you. I normally wouldn't have it in my hand. He says, when I was a boy in my father's house, still tender and the only child of my mother, verse 4, he taught me, he taught me, my dad did. Now let me tell you something, going back to the letter A for available, available, an advisor and an admonisher. You as a father, this is what you should be. Make yourself available. Strive to be available to your children. Today with smartphones and, and, and FaceTime and all that other stuff, come on, it's easier. It should be. He taught me. My father taught me these things. You can't teach somebody things. You're not an absentee teacher. This ain't no correspondence course. It's not about online degree and fatherhood. You got to get involved. You got to get your hands dirty. Roll up your sleeves. I got to work. I get it. Got to sleep. I get that too. But find the time. Make the, I guarantee you if I say, hey, man, I got some free Cub tickets to the Cubs game, put you right down the first base line or behind the, uh, behind the plate, or you'd find time. You'd manufacture time. <laughs> I'm telling you, you would. We find time. We make time for the things that are important to us. An admonisher. Accountability and our actions are the next two A's. You can put the actions first, our actions, and our accountability for those actions. Number one, uh, the actions, the things that we do, whether we obey God or whether we disobey God, will have an impact on our children. Here's your example. Abraham, Genesis, and his maidservant, Hagar. God promises him a son. Abraham thinks he's going to help God out. God don't need your help. Okay? God don't need your help. But in his mind, in his wisdom, in his finite, limited mind, Abraham decides he's going to sleep with his maidservant, Hagar. Thus, Ishmael is born. Nice. Descendants of the Muslim religion. Consequence, the Bible talks about it. There's going to be strife between your offspring and his. Generations later, thousands of years later, we're reaping the consequences of Abraham's disobedience. Our actions. Fathers, we cannot live our life and do whatever we want without consequence. I'm going to tell you guys something. My, my baby, Natalie, uh, is going to be 20. She just turned 23. She just turned 23. She just turned 23 in June. Kristen's going to be 27 in October. I still worry about the things I say, the things I do and how they will impact my daughters who don't even live in my house. And I take that really seriously because I strive to be a man of God, to live upright, to walk right, to teach them in the ways that they should go as the scripture says. And I worry about the things that I say, do, or don't do making promises and not keeping to those kinds of things. I worry about the impact that they will have on an adult female who don't even live in my house. You know why? Because I'm their father. Letter T. Teacher. You need to be a teacher. Proverbs 22.6, James, please. These kids quit. Proverbs 22.6, and we're going to Ephesians chapter 4 next, James, or chapter 6 next. Okay, the Bible says to train up a child in the ways that they should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. So this is the responsibility of the parents, but I'm talking to you, Father, because God has appointed you head of the household. We have a responsibility to train up our children. Is there a difference between teaching and training? You bet there is. I remember growing up as a young man learning to, to lift weights and how to work my body, to train my body to, to build muscle mass. I had a trainer, somebody who stood alongside me, told me, eat this, sleep this, drink this. Do these exercises. Take this much rest. I had a trainer who was right alongside me training me. And in this context, according to, uh, to Jewish, if you look at the Jewish culture, the father was involved with the son. Jesus was a carpenter because Joseph was a carpenter. Okay, there's an apprenticeship, if you will. There's a father modeling fatherhood to his son. 
modeling how to be a husband, modeling how to be a father. He's showing. It's not just talking to him and showing him. I, ta- I, uh, I coached softball for years. My daughter's willing I coached softball, and I was their coach. And to coach somebody, you have to get down and dirty. You got to be on the field with them. Can't just give them a DVD, say, go home and watch that. You got to show them. You got to correct them. The fundamentals, the mechanics, you have to work through all these things. It's no different when you're trying to instruct a child. But we leave that to the wife because she does a better job. She's home. It doesn't matter. You have a responsibility. God has called you to be a father. I don't, I'm tired. I don't care. I don't feel good. None of those excuses are going to matter when you stand before the Lord. And you will stand before the Lord. So we need to train our children. We need to be a trainer. Uh, go to Ephesians uh, 6, James. Verse 4. Well, let's stay here. Let's stay at 1. Children, go back to 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You don't have a choice. Obey your parents. Well, I'm 30 years old. I don't have to obey my parents. Okay. Honor your father. You may not have to obey them because you don't live in their house anymore. You may not have to obey their rules, be home by 10 o'clock and that kind of stuff. But you still have a responsibility to honor your parents. Somebody with your quick hands, uh, define the word honor online. Look for it on the dictionary. Find a synonym for me, please, to honor your parents. What does that mean? In today's context, we think that means you got to, you know, that you just got to bow down and kiss the ring. That's not what it means, is it? Does it? Somebody got a synonym for honor? High respect. respect. You know, great great esteem. I'll give you a great example. I love my mother. Lord knows I love my mother, but she is rough. This is a tough woman to love. You might not love her. Because she's harsh sometimes. But I love her because she's my mom. That's never going to change. I'm driving to my in-law's house for Mother's Day. This Mother's Day. I'm on the phone with my mom. I told Tina, I said, I don't want to call her. Because I know where this is going. So we have a conversation. And I don't want to get into a lot of details, but I'm like this. She's killing me. And we're stuck in traffic. And I'm like, man, hurry up and get Get to your mom's house, get to your sister's house where we're going. So I could tell my mom I got to go because we're here. But we're stuck in traffic, and I'm like, oh, oh, oh. And she's giving me an earful. I'm almost 48. I'm almost 48 years old. I'm a grown man. I got a grandkid. And mom, I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, you know, inside, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm feeling. I'm looking at Tina, Tina smile, and she shakes her head. God, I'm like, God, give me grace. So I told my mom. Hush already, you're getting on my nerves, old lady. Do you think I said that? No. There's no way in my wildest dream I would ever say that to my mom. Hang up on her and say, hey, mom, we lost the connection, sorry. I wouldn't do that, even if I thought I can get away with it. Because that's not honoring your mother. I have a, what would you say the synonym was? Deep respect? Thank you. No, I didn't. I have my back. High respect, great esteem, distinction, privilege. My mom is in a privileged position. She's my mother. Importance, merit, prestige. You, none of you could be my mom. She's my mom. God gave me one, and by his grace and his mercy, she's still alive. You better honor her when you still can. Does my mom frustrate me? Yes. Do I love her? Yes. Do I respect her? You doggone right I do. I would never disrespect my mother, not intentionally. If I disrespected my mom unintentionally, I would profusely apologize. You have a responsibility to honor your parent. That's forever, whether you're in your house or not. Testimony is your other T. The book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 15, James. This is beautiful. Listen. Uh, and when you go to college and you learn to write papers, they teach you this in high school depending on where you go, I guess. Some, they're just glad you get through knowing two plus two. <laughs> but depending on the high school you go to, they teach you composition writing. Composition writing tells you you begin with the end in mind. You tell somebody what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. That's typically how you write a composition. Okay? Same thing with paragraphs. Topic, sentence, give them and conclude it. It's the same thing. It's real simple writing. English is, is really simple when you learn the rules. So beginning with the end in mind, we, I, said, I told you in the last several weeks that with purpose, 
But with your identity, knowing who you are in Jesus Christ brings purpose. Amen? amen. If you know who you are in Jesus Christ, that brings purpose. Right. Amen? amen? Can I get amen? amen? Am I the only person who believes that? Amen. Okay, if I give you a hammer, that means I want you to hammer some stuff. Right? right? So if you know what your purpose is, if you know your identity, you know who you are, what you are, then you know what you've been created for. We know that this uh, flag stand was created to hold a flag, right? We know that this screen was pr produced, uh, somebody created it so that we can watch things on the TV set. You know that cups of coffee were made for coffee or tea or something hot, usually, not necessarily something cold, but you could use it for something cold, but it's created for something hot, right? right. Okay, so we're all on the same page, amen? Right. Sound like the three people in here, amen? amen? Okay, that's better. So here we go. If we know that we have purpose and we have an identity, we know what our purpose is, and here it is, church family. People ask me, you know, why do we come to church? Why do we learn all this stuff? You know, why does being a baby Christian matter? Does it matter that I've been sitting here for 20 years and I only got two biblical teeth, two spiritual teeth in my mouth, and I really can't cut the meat myself, and I'm still an infant that needs to be spoon-fed from the pulpit? Why is that a big deal? Why? What's the implication? I'll tell you why. You have a purpose. God created you with purpose. He saved you and drew you into relationship with him for a purpose. Purpose. The Bible says, what does God desire from us? Has not the Lord made them one in flesh and spirit? They are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. Godly offspring. That's the end. We begin with the end in mind. My mom and dad, my father, you know, there's 11 kids in my family. 11, and I'm number 10. You know why there's 11 kids? Listen. This is important. I'm going to stray off track for a second. Stay with me. There's 11 kids because my father married my mother and she already had five children from a previous marriage. Five. My mom and dad marry and they have a child that is stillborn. A boy. My father's first son. Yep. Come on. So my dad says, I want a son. Right. So they have another baby. My sister Emelise is born. So they try again. My sister Candida is born. My father says, I want a son. Yeah, come on. Yolanda's born. Oh, Lord have mercy. My father says, what am I going to do? I got to try again. Blanca's born. Lord have mercy. Lucky are you. Hey, I'm lucky that I wasn't my dad because I wouldn't be here. I would have stopped after two. Well, sure. Then he tries again. Here I come. Jose, number 10 in the pecking order, my father's only son. I have his name. I'm so proud to be my father's son. I'm so glad he tried so many times. Thank you, Dad. That's a beautiful thing. So grateful to my dad. I'm the only Burgos son. You know what my father was concerned about? Right, the Burgos name. The Burgos name. My father wanted godly offspring. My father wants his name. He wants Burgos to carry on. So me and Tina get married, have a baby. Christy's born. I have another one. I think, come on, son. Natalie's born. I'm like, I'm not going out like my dad. <laughs> See it. My father, my dad, looks at me and goes, exactly. you're not going to try again? I'm like, he said, come on, you got to try again. I'm like, I'm cursed. I'm telling you, I'm going to do what you did. I don't want five daughters. And he's, come on, son, you got to try again. I'm good, pop. I'm good with two girls. Preserving the Burgos name did not matter to me as much as it mattered to him. <laughs> Having a son. I mean, I look back now, and I, I, I wish I had a son, but God didn't give me one. But he gave me a grandson, praise the Lord. So he's still my blood, but he's not a Burgos. He didn't have my last name. So I understand what my father was concerned about. Guess what? That's from an earthly perspective where people's family name is important. We got... Seven generations of Burgos that go back on the island of Puerto Rico. My father tells me, every Moyet that lives on the island of Puerto Rico is related because your grandmother came from France, or her descendants did, her, her ancestors did. They came from France, they populated the island. Every Moyet on that island is related. My dad's proud of that, and most people are. They're proud of their family name. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. What I'm saying is we should be more concerned about the spiritual legacy that we're leaving behind. People should be able to trace. You should be the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth generation Christian. And we're not concerned about that nearly as much as we're concerned about our doggone last name. Will your offspring names 
be written in the Lamb's book of life? And if they're not, did you drop the ball there, Dad? Because God squares that, puts that squarely on your shoulders. Philippians 3.13, James, here's what I know. I, uh, how many of you saw the movie Courageous? I've shared this line from the movie probably three times in the last couple days. The fathers are sitting at a table. They're police officers, and they're talking. And one guy's talking about he had a crummy dad. The other one didn't know who his dad was. And one guy said, well, my dad was there. And one dude, you know, he says, I want to be a good dad. I want to be a good dad. And he's the main character in the movie. He says, I want to be a good dad. And the other guy tells him, I think you're a pretty good dad. And the main character, he's one of the Kendrick brothers, he looks at me and goes, good dad? I don't want to be a good dad. Right. I want to be a great dad. Right. Good's not good enough. It's a case of good, better, and best. Where are you at, Father? Are you leading your family courageously like God has called you to? It doesn't matter if you like to or you want to or you feel equipped to. It's a fact. God has called you to it. Step up, man up, and do what God created you to do. Lead your family to church. Bring them to church. Don't stay home. Well, I don't really like Brother Dennis's preaching. Too bad. Well, Tuesday night prayer services are boring. Too bad. Bring your family to church. Well, my kid don't want to. Your kid is a kid in your house. Bring him to church. He's got to work. He can work six other days of the week. Don't make him work Tuesday night. You don't even have to work. If he's your kid, you have a responsibility to provide for your kid. He's got the rest of his life to work. I can't be here, Pastor, because I got to work. Well, that's because you signed up for the overtime? Uh-oh. Or did you have to work? There's a the difference between have to work and want to work. Money's good. Is God good or not? Amen. The Bible says that God should provide all of your needs. All of your needs. Either we believe that or God's a liar. So my point in that is this. The other T in father was thrive. Losing my place here. To thrive. Philippians 3.13. Father, 3.13. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forget what's behind me and straining forward towards what is ahead. God has called you to bigger. God has called you to better. And we sing that song, you're a good, good father. I think the bridge says, uh, you're perfect in all of your ways to us. Uh, the part where he says, thank you, brother. Man, you are the man, James. Go to the next one. See why I call them fast hands? There it is, right there. Love so undeniable, I can hardly speak. Peace so unexplainable, I, I can hardly think as you call me. Deeper still as you call me. Deeper still as you call me. Deeper still into love. Love. Your good, good father is calling you deeper. Sink your roots in and draw deeper. Draw closer. It's never good enough. I'm a good enough Christian. God doesn't want good enough. He wants great. Let's move from good to better to best. God deserves it. Amen? So if you're a father and you feel like you've been coasting, put your foot on the gas. Let's go. God has not disqualified you. Satan's whispering in your ear thinking he has, telling you he has. Letter H, and I'm going to blow through these prom- quickly, promise you. I promise you I will. Hands on. You need to be your hands on father. The Bible says <clears throat> in Ephesians chapter 6, go back to it for me, James. Uh, we should be united in unity and in harmony. That's your first H under hands on. We should be in harmony. Our family should be in harmony. You know what's wrong with our world today? We're out of balance. You got two fathers and a son. You got two mothers and a daughter. You got a mother and no father. A father and no mother, or a mother and a father, and one of them is checked out because they're working all the time? The world's jacked up. We've strayed away from the biblical roles that God has called us to, and we're reaping what we've sown. Yes. Chapter 4. I said, go to 6 for me, will you, James? The 6, verse 4. Harmony. I'm talking about harmony in the home. Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Synonym for exasperate. Anyone? You want to uh, define that one for me, James, with your quick hands? Yours says provoke. That's good. Provoke your children. 
You know, in the original translation, the word exasperate, I don't like to sound like one of those scholars who will tell you what the word is. What the word exasperate means in the original language is to knock the wind right out your kid. When your kid says, Daddy, you know the way you talk to mom, I don't think Jesus likes that. Okay, now maybe your kid could have took a lesson in tact, but he's spot on. Nonetheless, he's rebuking you with the word of God, and you don't like it, and you tell your kid, shut up, kid. You don't physically hit him. Shut up, kid. I'm the adult. You're the kid. Go to your room. Shut your mouth. Your kid goes, Pum. be the last time your kid ever quotes scripture to you, maybe ever, or tries to in their attempt. That's exasperating your child, knocking the wind right out of them, physically, mentally, emotionally, choking the life right out of them. The Bible says don't do that. You're a father. Your family should live in harmony. You should not be harsh with your children, and you should not be harsh with your wife, but I'm talking to fathers. Head, 523, Ephesians 523, James. There's your letter H. Under hands-on, as a father, you need to be hands-on with your children. It's how you coach them. It's how you train them. It's how you teach them. Don't be harsh with them. You have a responsibility. You are the head of the household. Ephesians 5, 23 says, Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training of the Lord. It says, For the husband is the head, in 23, head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church and his body for which he is Savior. God has appointed you to be the head of the family. Father... In churches today, the women are leading out. The women are courageous. We have women pastors. We have women preachers. And people say, oh, they ought not do that. Why wouldn't they when the men are failing to step up uh -oh. into their God-given roles and responsibilities? Uh -oh. We need somebody to stand up. And fortunately for us, women rise to the occasion. I don't agree with Well, then stand up. Yep. The ladies in almost in every Christian church I've been in beat the pants off of the dudes when it comes to serving. Yep. Sorry, guys. True story. Holy, 1 Peter 1 and 16. It's your last H for hands-on. Under hands-on and fathers, you have a responsibility to be holy. For the Bible says to be holy, for I am holy. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. This passage is not written in the context of fathers, but nonetheless it still applies. As a father is holy and separated to serve God. Why? For the purpose of godly offspring. E, edify. Your responsibility as a father is to edify your children. You build them up. Don't tear them down. You think the world's going to do it? Only if they're a stud. If your kid is a standout athlete, then the world might esteem your kid and build them up. If your kid's mediocre, lucky if they get any encouragement at all. It is your responsibility to equip your child, to encourage your child. The Bible says to be earnest, to serve the Lord in all sincerity. Can you honestly say, fathers, that you're giving your best? Endurance. Come on now. Here's your other E, endurance. And it's, this being a Christian is not for chumps. Being a Christian is not for the faint-hearted. Nope. Being a Christian is not warrior. for wimps. That's what you are. You are a warrior, a warrior for Jesus Christ. You are a champion for Christ. You have to put on. That's why the Bible describes the armor of God. Yeah. This is not for the faint-hearted. And a lot of us, the first time we get kicked in the mouth, we're, oh, Satan's too tough. He's not. He's defeated. He's a defeated foe, and all he can do is this. You have to choose whether you're going to believe him or believe God. Do we believe God? Amen. Do we believe God? Amen. Earn it. It's just a marathon. It's not a sprint. When I was a kid, I was pretty fast. I challenge anybody to a race in like a, a, a block or less. If it's a half a block race, I was confident that I could win or at least put a good fight. Now, you say, hey, let's run 26 miles. I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm not running no marathons. That's too much work. I can run hard and fast for a short period of time, but I didn't want to go for a long period of time. Well, the Christian walk is a marathon. It's a long distance race. Pastor Joey talked to you a couple of weeks ago about finishing the race. The Bible says in Colossians 3 and 17, James 3, 17, whatever you do in word or in deed, do it unto the Lord. Whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whether it's in word or deed, whether you say anything, whether you do anything, you should do it as if you're doing it for God. And that includes raising your children. Letter R, for role model. Whether you like it or not, your kids are looking at you. You can be a good example to your children by the way you live your life, or you can be a horrible example. But nonetheless, your kids will learn from your example. Be a role model. You want to be respected by your children. 
so you have to be respectable. What we forget as adults is that it's a two-way street. You can't disrespect a child, even a child. Sit down and shut up, you little twerp. And the kid sits down and shut up. And you think, he respects me. No, you don't. He's seething with disobedience in his heart. He's rolling his eyes at you. Maybe not on the outside because you'll smack him out of his head, but on the inside. People, I'm, I've got to explain myself to you. You should. Give the kid an explanation. Respect the child, and typically they will respect it back. Now, I'm not talking about relinquishing your eyes as a parent because when push comes to shove, you're the parent. They're going to do what you say. But be respectful if you want to be respected. Rebuke your children. Rebuke them. When they're out of line, correct them the right way. This is something I had to learn as a father. I thought smacking my kid whenever they did wrong was the answer. It was my wonderful wife who showed me there's a better way. You don't, have to, you don't have to smack all the time. If you believe in discipline, physical discipline, you don't have to smack all the time. Sometimes a, a sharp word correction goes a long way. You'd be surprised. Now, some kids need a spanking every now and then. And, and if that's what you do, as long as you do it and, and to correct and to rebuke, I don't disagree with that. I think the Bible gives way to that. But I don't, you don't do it out of anger. You do it with the purpose of correcting the behavior. Here's your other letter, R. Under role model, I have respect, respectful, respected, rebuke, remember. Remember what? What's the end game? What's the goal? Father, godly offspring. You want your kid to turn 18, leave the church, and be done? No. You want him to go to college and get chewed up and spit out by the world in which we live in that says that God's not real, he's dead, he's something people made up, and start planting all these seeds that Satan did in Genesis chapter 3? You want your kid to stray away from the word and stray away from the Lord because you didn't properly prepare them, equip them, and train them up as the scripture had commanded you to? Remember your purpose, godly offspring. You're not going to live forever. I can't believe I'm almost 50. Right. Right. And if God gives me 30 good more years, I'll be 80. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I think you lose a step as you go, don't you think? Don't do all the things you used to do. Don't remember like you used to. Life is fleeting. You will not be here forever. You need to pass the baton on to your children who will pass the baton on to their children. Who will pass. That is the Christian legacy. And we're failing, church. We're failing. And a big reason why we're failing is falls right squarely on the shoulders of the fathers who refuse to step up into their God-given role and responsibility that God has given them. Run the race. Run the race. Here's your S and fathers, since I'm talking to more than one of you. Sanctified. I don't care what the other fathers look like. Come on. I don't care what the other fathers look like. My father, I got a friend at work. He worked all this overtime, socked away thousands of dollars, and paid for his kids' college education. Great. That's a beautiful thing. He, he sent the kid to school, and he don't even got to pay. Done. No loans. There. Great. At what cost? What cost? Did he bring the kid to church? Did he teach the kid to serve? Did he spend time with this kid? Did he help develop this kid? Did he edify his kid? Was he there for his kid? Or was he one of those fathers that was in the A I was talking about in fathers, unavailable? Right. Not available because he's too busy working trying to save money for their college degree. You can't, you can't do it all. It's a question of good, better, and best. What's most important? Your children are. God has given them to you. Here's your last S. Stewards. Ooh. They ain't your kids. They're his kids, and he's given to me, given them to you on loan for a little while. This is why Abraham had no problems putting his son on the altar, wow. because he recognized that his son was not his. He was God's. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. So God has given you your children for a season. They ain't yours. They're his. And he's going to ask you. He's going to ask you. What have you done with what I've given you? The biggest, best treasure I've given you besides eternal life was the ability to influence a child for the glory of God and promote my lineage, the kingdom of God, a hundred 200, 300, 400 years down the road, 1,000 years down the road, but we're all gone.
God's going to ask you, what have you done with that I've entrusted to you? I'm talking to fathers. Now, some of you are here, you're telling me I'm not a father. But you know what? You have a father, and I just pray that if he wasn't a good example, I pray that you would learn how to be a good example. I'm telling you, this godly offspring thing is important. Listen, if you're here today and you say, you know what? I've dropped the ball. I've not been the best father that I can be. Some of you want to be fathers someday. But I'm here to tell you, the biggest and most important part of this message today is this, stewardship. What are you doing with what God has given you? God has given you children. For what? What do you think he gave them to you for? To leave them at home when we have Juanas? Not bring them to church because he's tired, because he's up all night playing Fortnite? Don't want to come because he's got a soccer game? You think any of that's going to fly when you stand before the Lord? It's not. <laughs> Pastor Frank and I was praying before we came in this morning. He says, there's really two things we can do with the gospel. Either we can accept it or we can reject it. The truth is there's four things we can do. We can spread it. Or we can keep it to ourselves, And then we can either accept it or reject it. There's really four things we can do with it. And when it comes to your children, you can either step up and into your godly responsibility of stewardship as a father or not. That choice is yours. But you'll ultimately reap what you have sown. And don't blame God for you failing to follow his blueprint, his design for your life. I'm going to ask James, go ahead and put some music on for us as we respond. Here's what I want you to do as uh, the music plays. If the spirit of God has spoken to you this morning in any way, shape or form, I would encourage you to come forward as the music plays. This is our response time. As the music's playing, I want you to ask the Spirit of God to show you in your heart the areas you need to grow in. One of the T's in Father was to thrive. Are you thriving? Yeah. We were meant to more, we were meant, we were created for more than surviving. God wants us to thrive in our relationship with Him and our relationships with others. If you're coasting, I want to encourage you. The Bible says, choose today whom you will serve. Serve God with all sincerity. Serve God with all sincerity. If you're coasting, if you're cruising, whether it's in your walk with God, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your children, put your foot back on the gas pedal. God deserves better.